Hello there, Action Johnny back with another build guide for you guys today, and this time we'll be taking a look at a build for the Zealot. I'd like to present a build to you that I call the Retributor. The concept behind this build is twofold. You are both a protective linchpin of the party, providing both support and survivability, and also a powerful AoE damage dealer that excels at a zone of control playstyle. It's a specialist build over a generalist one, which means you'll be really strong in certain aspects, but paying for that strength by having a couple of weaknesses you'll need your team to cover. Nevertheless, giving your teammates the room they need to do their thing is pretty much the forte of this build. So if you like fire, faith, and fury, and also generally being a helpful buddy, then this one is for you. So for this build, we'll be running the Holy Trinity of Area Denial Weaponry. The Eviscerator, freshly buffed post-patch and an absolute monster when it comes to killing pretty much anything that isn't carapace armored. The Flamer, which remains a fairly unpopular pick for the Zealot, but for all intents and purposes is still an insanely strong weapon with infinite cleave and the ability to melt mixed hordes and bosses into a slurry. And finally, the Immolation Grenade, which is even more AoE damage and an excellent tool for creating a zone mortalis, or more bluntly put, a murder zone. Between these three holy armaments, we are geared to absolutely annihilate whatever deigns to come near our party. We'll go into detail on the weapons in just a bit, but for context, let's take a look at the talent tree first and what we're running with. Okay, so first of all we'll start off at the top and work all the way down to the bottom before picking our splash points. We'll be going straight through this middle tree, collecting anointing blood, purge the unclean, and restoring faith here. Then of course, the Immolation Grenade. We'll be carrying on through the middle, getting the Emperor's Bullet, Shield of Contempt, the Hammer of Faith, and the Beacon of Purity. And then again, carrying on through the middle to get Chorus of Spiritual Fortitude, Banishing Light, Toughness Damage Reduction Node, and Faithful Frenzy for the 10% melee attack speed because it's just too good not to take. And finally, we'll be grabbing our keystone, which will be suppression, punishment, movement speed, invocation of death, and then the keystone itself, blazing piety, fury rising, and righteous warrior. And that leaves us with eight points to spend. All right, so back up to this row, and we're going over to take the melee damage, the movement speed, until death, and Holy Revenant to round out our survivability package, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then for your splash, you have a couple of options. So in the exact version of the build I'm running, I personally take Backstabber and then Scourge for even more critical hit chance. And then I also take the melee damage boost and sustained assault in the bottom right corner just because it is a stacking damage buff that reliably stacks with every swing and combined with the melee damage node you get a nice 25 percent out of this you do have some other options though you can take ecclesiarch's call you will be using chorus of spiritual fortitude a lot thanks to invocation of death and your insanely high, high crit rate. So Ecclesiarch's Call isn't the worst selection. Then with the last three points, you could go Disdain here, which is very similar to the talent in the bottom right corner, except this one only works when you hit multiple enemies with an attack. And then Backstabber and Scourge. Or if you're not interested in those, you could pass down here for thy wrath be swift. So you certainly have some options, but if you're like me, then you'll be taking Scourge for max crit chance, and then good old reliable sustained assault here. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the various strengths of the build and what it brings. 
Uh, starting with the survivability package, aka the hard to kill package. So this package is restoring faith, uh, which essentially might as well say 25% uh, damage reduction against HP because that's how it works. Shield of Contempt, which is an insanely efficient talent and applies to your allies in coherency as well as yourself. So every 10 seconds, this will trigger if people are getting hit. So super high value, super survivable talent. And of course, we have Until Death and Holy Revenant here. These need no introduction and synergize really well with the other two talents. And our last sort of support, healing, toughness, defense, whatever you want to call it thing here is the Beacon of Purity. I absolutely love this aura because it's really unique. There's nothing else that interacts with corruption in any of the talent trees. And this is just really great for sort of stopping your various party members from dying in annoying ways. This does somewhat help with multiple burster hits. It also helps versus dogs. Just useful. Good aura. I really like it. We'll talk a little bit about our area denial talents next. So that's the immolation grenade, which of course puts a literal no-go zone down on the floor where enemies will take damage if they fight us. And the last and most powerful area denial control tool we have is, of course, the Chorus of Spiritual Fortitude, which has a nice combo you can do with the Fire Grenade, where you'll chuck the Fire Grenade at your feet. Let's say there's suddenly like 15 elites in your face that weren't there a second ago, and you don't have time to get your flamer out. You can throw the Fire Grenade at your feet, and you can whip out Chorus of Spiritual Fortitude and stun lock them in the fire. Talking a little bit more about Chorus of Spiritual Fortitude, it's an incredibly powerful ability. This with Banishing Light, which I'll just talk about as if it's, you know, part of the ability because you have to path through it anyway. It will shut down any gunner that has line of sight to you, so they literally just won't be able to shoot you. So if they can see you, you can shut them down. And it will stagger all enemies in an area around you. This tool right here is going to be your go-to for dealing with sudden packs of crushers and large amounts of enemies that pop up and start shooting the party. This should always give you enough space to not die in those situations. Now, while of course it doesn't kill the enemies, it certainly swings the momentum for you and your party in your favor and gives you some time to start pinging the things that need to die. Now, because you don't really have any range tools, you are reliant on your party members for shooting shooters that are far away. And because none of your tools are especially good at killing crushers, again, you are reliant on whoever's bringing the anti-carapace tools. But what this does is gives your party the space to safely do these things. And it protects them as well with overshield. So it, it's absolutely amazing and just an incredibly powerful support tool. The trade-off, of course, is you're not doing any damage while it's working, but that's a small price to pay. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the engine of the build, which is uh, this set of nodes down in the corner here. So Invocation of Death is what really tips this build over the edge in terms of its support capabilities, because with this running, you'll basically always have your prayer off cooldown, which means that you can always reverse a bad situation. Of course, Blazing Piety is what makes Invocation of Death good, as it provides the higher critical hit percentage chance you need to get it triggering and also just like more damage with the eviscerator which has got pretty nice finesse stats anyway that's the bill in its entirety now let's have a look at our tools of war with its long reach and large sweeping attacks the eviscerator is the perfect melee weapon to supplement our strategy it also has access to the shred blessing which basically gives us stacking crit chance with every attack landed meaning it compounds with the crit chance from blazing piety and synergizes with Invocation of Death for rapid cooldown reduction. With max stacks of Shred and Blazing Piety, your critical hit chance sits at a massive 50%, meaning you'll be critting all the time. If you also choose to splash Scourge like I do, you can boost the upper end crit chance to 80%. All this crit chance isn't just a means to empower Invocation of Death either. It also boosts the Eviscerator's power pretty massively, affecting damage, cleave and impact. Blessing-wise, you absolutely 100% want Shred on this bad boy for all the reasons I've just mentioned. As for the second blessing, you have the choice of Savage Sweep, Rampage, and Bloodletter. 
Savage Sweep used to be mandatory on the Eviscerator, but in this build, I feel it's the least desirable of the three blessings I just mentioned. Just because the Eviscerator's Cleave has been buffed pretty substantially and you'll be critting a lot with it, which means even more Cleave. You can't really go wrong with Rampage as it's just a flat power boost versus Hordes and Mix Hordes, which is always appreciated, but again, in this build, it doesn't feel super necessary. Finally, you can run Bloodletter, which is what I run because Bleed is strong in this patch. And being able to rapidly apply Bleed stacks to bosses for damage over time and crit chance, or being able to apply Bleed to a Horde gives the weapon an extra dimension past its obvious use case. Perk-wise, Flak is the absolute best perk you can roll on this, as it covers the largest amount of enemies you do extra damage versus. And for the second perk, you can choose between Unyielding, Maniac, and Carapace. Maniac and Unyielding are the be even better at doing what we're already good at perks, while Carapace is there to provide a little extra damage when dealing with this build's nemesis enemy, the Crusher. The Flamer is an incredibly powerful tool when it's utilized for its purpose, which is to melt into slag any enemy that tries to push your party. It's not without its downsides, however. Obviously, range is the first limitation that comes to mind, but it's also quite cumbersome, having a pretty significant delay between wielding it and actually starting up the torrent. It does have some decent stagger options on it to somewhat aid in this unwieldiness, possessing both a bash to quickly stagger enemies right up in your grill, and a primary fire mode that shoots a gout of flame with high stagger values. This latter attack can be used to interrupt specials, other than that, the weapon is fairly simple to use. Make sure you have enough space to wield it, turn on the torrent, and melt whatever is in front of you. With 23 meters effective range and infinite cleave, anything that's not carapace armored will die. Between your damage boosting talents, weapon perks, and weapon blessings, there's no mixture of enemies, save for crusher packs, that will make it to your lines. Blessing-wise, I stick both overpressured and blaze away on the flamer to maximize my damage versus all targets, it's not really a particularly interesting blessing combo, but the numbers don't lie when it comes to pushing your damage. Perk-wise, again, Flak is king, and Unyielding is an easy second perk to maximize boss damage, which, by the way, this thing is no slouch at killing. So this build is fairly straightforward to play, as you are limited by a specialist role. Quite simply, your job is to act as the nucleus of the party, staying close to the rest of your teammates and providing them with an area of safety by utilizing your various area control tools. Your bread and butter here is the Eviscerator, which will happily grind through chaff all day long and recharge your prayer in the process. It's also strong against the specials that like to run at the party, such as the Muti, the Hound, and both Flamers. Prayer can and should be used liberally in the build, since it shuts down any shooting enemy that has line of sight to you, and staggers everything around you, while also providing 100 overshield to your team. Prayer is usually your best response versus large squads of gunners and shooters that surprise the party, giving your party the much needed breathing room and safety to reposition. Prayer is also going to be your strongest tool versus crusher packs as well, which is an enemy type this build struggles with. Make sure to ping when these stacks of crushers do show up so your teammates know to take advantage of the stagger duration. The flamer can hold down entire flanks and channels on its own, and I tend to use it in four ways. Annihilating enemies in a confined space, suppressing and staggering and melting shooters in cover the party is pushing towards, barbecuing a mixture of dangerous enemy types running at the party, and finally killing monsters. The fire grenade is the ace in your sleeve, whether you use it on gunner positions outside of your flamer's effective range, or as a clutchy defensive tool to shut down an overwhelming amount of enemies pushing into your space. There are moments in game where you will need AoE damage but do not have the 3 or 4 seconds it takes to get the flamer going, and it's in these instances the fire grenade shines. Simply drop it at your feet, whip out your holy icon, and voila! You have a group of enemies trapped in a roasting pit that just lost all their momentum. So as previously mentioned, this build does struggle against crushers. None of your weapons are good against them, which can definitely catch you out if you're not careful. Thankfully, the meta is absolutely stuffed full of crusher killers at the minute, so if you do suddenly find yourself accosted by a rabble of armored ogrins, start praying and let your team handle them. 
Range and space can also be natural enemies of this build. While you excel within more closed spaces, you might find that engagements in big open rooms where enemies can spread out a bit of a struggle. Luckily, again, prayer goes some way to offset this weakness, with its effect shutting down shooters that can see you and allowing you breathing room in those kinds of engagements. You've also got no real way of dealing with trappers and snipers, who can both outmaneuver and outrange you. While these weaknesses might seem glaring, when you measure them against the huge amount of value you bring to your team in terms of providing safety and space, it's really a small price to pay. This build's playstyle definitely won't be for everyone, but if you're looking for a strong and dedicated support build, then this one will serve you well. After that deluge of information, if you're keen to see the build in action, or you're just curious to see how I play it, I've left a link down in the description below to an Auric Maelstrom level game where you can check it out. Thank you very much for watching my video, and I'll see you guys in the next one.